Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cup of Fern. My name is Mark Itelli. Uh Tonight, we are joined with the extremely brilliant Morgan Pinkerton from Seminole IFAS. Uh, so it is a rare treat for me to have someone in the region that we represent also presenting. So thank you so much, for uh, Morgan, for your time. Uh, I'm going to start with our announcements really quickly and then hand things over to Morgan. She'll be happy to introduce herself to you all. And uh, this special program is uh, fun, interesting, it's native plants, and it's food with native plants. So uh, what better way to exemplify the importance of native plants when they actually feed, uh, sustain, and are such an important part of our economy. So welcome, guys. Our uh, uh, our mission statement is the conservation preservation of native plants and native plant communities, as you know. Members, please report your monthly volunteer hours. If you are watching this from a screen like your tablet or even on your TV through YouTube Live, uh, simply point your phones. Here's the QR code. Um, it'll take you maybe five, less than five minutes to complete it. Lump all your hours together. Driving time is included. Uh, viewing this program is included. So in case you participated in any programs last month, lump all of them together. Typically, the uh, drop-down selection for you all is education hours. So please report your monthly volunteer hours, especially if you are an FNPS member. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I don't know if you guys know this, but we have over 100 educational YouTube videos now. And I'm going to pull up this uh, tab right here. This is our page, youtube.com slash fern. Click on the subscribe button on the right-hand corner here. Uh, there's tons of videos that you can watch. Matter of fact, you can watch this uh, presentation later on and catch up with it in case there was something that you, uh, intrigued you. You can go back to it and watch that particular section. So see native plants like never before on our YouTube channel and the license plate. So you probably have heard Native Plant Society is doing a license plate. fnps.org slash support slash license. Uh, there's the nifty QR code again. Uh, go ahead and point your uh, smartphones to it and it'll give you additional information on that. And speaking of license plate, they're running a little campaign now. And here we have Melanie Simon, our wonderful passion flower chapter president and she is showcasing a sample license plate on the back of her car. So you can be part of the license plate endeavor too. Did you guys know that we have a native plant art group? Uh, yes, we do. It's actually three years old. There are over 2000 members now and it's on Facebook. So it's a group for artists and admirers from all walks of life, celebrating and supporting each other and Florida's native plants in any and all ways. So I'm gonna show you the Facebook page right now. It's called Florida Native Plants Art Group, facebook.com slash groups slash FL Native Plants Art. I'll put that in the chat box as well. But here it is. And we have artists showcasing their photography, paints, uh, even music, uh, sounds of nature, and the list goes on and on. So I brought this up because every year we do a very special outreach for the native plant artists. And it is called the kick off your holiday shopping Thanksgiving weekend with native plant art products. So it's a native plant shopping season. And we do this campaign all, uh, all through the Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, we'll be showcasing different artists. If you, you happen to be an artist yourself, contact us. Uh, send us a quick email. Our email address is fern. It's all one word, at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to showcase you. But all your plant art products need to be native plant art products, Florida native plant art, plant art. So that's what we're looking for. And the good news is that last year when we ran this campaign, every single artist that we showcased actually had sales that were directly trackable to the campaign. So the artists benefited. We were very happy to showcase them. We don't make any commission off of this. This is just done from the goodness of our hearts. So if you happen to know an artist or if, if you happen to be an artist, uh, we strongly encourage you to take advantage of this campaign. It's totally free for you guys. 
and it is over Thanksgiving weekend. We're having a native plant sale at Lake Helens. So this is in West Volusia, uh, slightly south of Deland. In case you don't know where Lake Helen is, it's a little charming little town. December 4th, which is a Saturday, and it's actually conveniently in the afternoon. So it's not really in the morning when it's uber chilly on a winter day. It's from 1230 to 530. And this is in tandem with their Christmas home tour. So in case you guys are in the holiday spirit, you want to check out some uh, homes that are decorated uh, to the nines in the uh, Christmas festivities. Uh, do do that as well, uh, and we'll have a native plant sale in conjunction with it. It's the Lake Helen Christmas Home Tour, and we're doing a native plant sale at the event as well. That's again December 4th, 1230 p.m. until 530 p.m. And speaking of holidays, we are actually having our holiday social, and it is back in person. I couldn't be happier. So last year, due to COVID, we had it online. We had virtual games, virtual prizes. We uh, awarded those prizes. Uh, we stuck them in the mail and we sent them off to our live viewers, but we're back in person this time. And it's at our wonderful home location, our home base at Seminole Ifus, December 13th, which I believe is the second Monday in December. Uh, we'll be recognizing our couple of fern heads in, in the area of service. So we'll be giving them awards. There will be food. So if you're showing up, do plan to bring something for the potluck. There will be games. So we have our world famous trivia. So it's all about plants, trivia, trivia. And then we have team thought and we'll have speed spelling. So uh, buckle up, it's gonna be a fun ride. And of course there'll be prizes for everybody to enjoy. And in conjunction, if you happen to be a new FNPS member and part of the Couple of Fern family or friends, uh, I'm offering a master class for people that want to get to know FNPS.org better. If you are new, don't know where to start, um, the website is too comprehensive. You just need to know exactly where to retrieve information and move on with the rest of your day. I am here to help you. So we, we'll, I will be at Seminole IFAS. Uh, come join me right before the holiday social kicks off at 6:30. I'll be in the uh, seminal auditorium around 515. Bring your laptop that is preferred or bring your smartphone. So whichever you would like, bring that and we'll help you navigate through fnps.org, the website, to see what all the activities and outreaches that FNPS does. And Couple of Fern members. So if you're wondering what, what is Couple of Fern? Well, we are a chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. We're an independent, 501c3 organization as well. We mainly serve Central Florida with a focus in the North Orlando metropolitan area suburbs. So that's our direct service region, Seminole County, West Volusia. Those areas are direct service region. Or you happen to be an exclusive distance learner. We have people that are a couple of firm members in Wisconsin or Indiana or somewhere else. So if you happen to be a couple of Fern supporter, you love our outreaches, uh, do not hesitate to support us through membership. So come grow with us, see native plants like never before. I think it's gonna be my, my jingle for the next year. See native plants like never before. I just love that. Um, we do a lot, so come join us. Holiday socials coming up. We do a lot of workshops. We do community gardening, Seminole IFAS. We have a little a uh, demonstration garden patch within the Florida friendly landscape that we showcase native plants that are exclusively found in Seminole County. Uh, we have one that is uh, just about to break ground at the Seminole Historical Museum, which is within the same complex. So we're, we're gonna have two demonstration gardens uh, pretty close to one another. So we do community gardening, we do workshops, we have environmental study areas where we go out to a natural area uh, routinely and just observe and track its development. Um, there's a term called ecological succession in native plants. Uh, that is something that is centric to environmental study areas. We just track it over time to see how it develops or just simply support us. So in case you happen to be one of those distant learners, uh, just support us through membership. Um, we do a lot of virtual learning as you see now uh, and we also support interns. So in case you have a student uh, that is in college, undergraduate preferably, 
Uh, we would love to take them under our wings and just open their eyes as far as native plants, our natural ecosystems, um, and just uh, appreciating them uh, like never before. Uh, you'll begin to see uh, the uh, wilderness and uh, roadside vegetation in different ways. And you understand the language of plants and the story that they tell. So we would love to have you as an intern. Or if you have somebody that could be an intern, please refer them to us. And this is us. So last Saturday, we were actually at a Sandhill site. And this is the team. Uh, the, the lady in the blue shirt is actually our intern this semester, Haley. We had a nice time, so come join us. Uh, this is Couple of Fern in, in a picture. A picture says a thousand words, right? So here it is. So Florida Native Plant Society, refer someone, uh, someone today, fnps.org. So I'm gonna pull up fnps.org real quick. And this is fnps.org slash join. It'll take you to this page, which is called membership. You can click on individual, multi-member. They have a full-time student, which is just $15. And in case you are a business or a nonprofit, uh, they have a very reasonable uh, nonprofit and business due, annual due. So it's very reasonable uh, in, the, uh, in these times. I'm um, just gonna click on individual. It's gonna take me to this uh, form here. You just go fill it out. And if you are interested in becoming a Cup of Fern member, you can click this, the chapter, and it'll say Cup of Fern. However, if you happen to be in Florida and you are local to another region and you want to make a difference locally, we, so, uh, we actually recommend that you select a chapter that uh, you'd like to make a difference uh, on a more local ground. So if you are within our region, you should automatically sort to it or you can definitely select it. But say, for example, you are out in South Florida or in the Panhandle, definitely support those chapters. And without further ado, uh, we have Native Plants and Agriculture with Mar Morgan Pinkerton. Uh, Morgan, if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, to, to the viewership, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thanks for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, as Mark said, my name is Morgan Pinkerton. I'm with UFIFAS Extension in Seminole County. Um, I'm a fairly new extension agent. I started my extension career last year. Uh, it's been a whirlwind the last year and a half. I started amidst all of the fun virtual things that we are continuing to do even today. A little bit of background about myself. I'm a graduate of the Doctor of Plant Medicine program from the University of Florida. And this is a really highly integrated program that focuses on plant health. So I have a lot of background in entomology, plant pathology, soil science, all as it relates to keeping plants happy, healthy, and of course my favorite ones, the edible ones. I think I got into this profession just because I love food so much and I love science and this really tied it together very, very well um, to basically find a career within both of those passions, um, enjoying the food side of things as well as the science behind growing plants. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the agricultural native plants we have here in the state of Florida. Um, so this includes a little bit of um, wine, blueberries, and we'll get into quite a few other native plants here today as well. I do want to start off and make sure my slides transition. There we go. I want to start off with a definition of agriculture just because it is something that I am so passionate about. Um, and a lot of people don't really know a whole lot about agriculture nowadays. And that's because we're getting further and further removed from the farm. So it used to be where you were pretty close to where the food was being grown and you ate fairly locally. And now we live in a world where we can get products from all the way across the world within a day's notice. So really fast those agricultural goods are moving. And like I said, we're becoming a little bit further removed from that farming process. But we should be aware of what goes on behind the scenes to get that food to our plates. And the definition I have here of agriculture is the science, art, or practice of cultivating the soil, producing crops, raising livestock, 
livestock and in a varying degrees, the preparation and marketing of the resulting products. I really like this definition because it truly is a science, it is an art, and it is super complex. It, a lot of people think it's very, very easy to produce a bunch of food, and there are so many things that can go wrong on the farm, and so many things that can go wrong along the way for that product to travel to your plate. And so we really should thank the work that our farmers are doing um, because it is an incredible job to feed the continually growing population of the world. And I do want to talk a little bit about agriculture specifically in Florida. This is our second largest industry in the state, and that's next to tourism. And even in the state of Florida, a lot of our agricultural operations incorporate aspects of tourism into their day-to-day -day doings. Um, so for example, if you've ever been to a U-Pick operation, that's a great example where you're picking your own food and you're also experiencing agriculture. So that's tourism and agriculture combined. In the state of Florida, just the agricultural industry alone is valued at $7.35 billion. So that's a ton of money right there. A lot of money, it brings in a lot of jobs in our state, and it's really, really critical to our local economy. And we are also the top producers of a lot of different products. Many of you may be well familiar with the amount of oranges and citrus production we have in the state, but we're also top producers for tomatoes, watermelons, fresh market beans, corn, sweet corn specifically, and a lot of other things. And throughout the state, our agriculture is very different. What's going on in North Florida is very, very different than what's going on in South Florida, where we can grow a lot more tropical products. So we have a huge diversity of stuff here, a lot of different tasty foods. And I'm going to focus a little bit on Central Florida today because that is where my home is and where I do a lot of my work in agriculture. I am located in Seminole County, like I mentioned before. So just to highlight a little bit of the local agriculture in Seminole County. So we're located right in the center of the state, a little bit inland from the East Coast. And we're a pretty small county, but we still have over 400 farms in the county. Um, so being a highly urbanized county, these farms are very much spaced throughout these very urban areas. And in Central Florida alone, we're continuing to see that trend where we're seeing a lot of development. The farms are getting smaller or they're getting encroached upon by that housing, that market development and everything that surrounds the urban areas. But in Central Florida, we still see strong ties to agriculture. The farmers that are there continue to stay strong. And we have new farmers and new, more urban agricultural operations popping up with new technologies underway every single day. A lot of our Seminole County producers are fairly small scale, or they have a very diverse type of product um, where they're selling multiple different things, they grow a lot of different things, or the, a lot of them are selling also direct to the consumer. So you are getting that farm straight, you are getting that product straight from the farm, uh, the farmer, him or herself. Um, so it's a really cool, unique type of agriculture we have in Seminole County, and I've been super excited to be enjoying that for the last year and a half and continue to see our county evolve in terms of what kinds of new technologies from hydroponics to aquaponics and all sorts of cool stuff showing up in the county. So I do want to bring this back to the title of the talk today and talk a little bit about native plants in Florida agriculture. Well, a lot of our agricultural in Florida and a lot of our high value crops are actually non-native. So one of our biggest crops being oranges and citrus, that is a non-native plant. Um, there is this long tradition in the United States for us to seek really cool products elsewhere and then start to grow them in our own area. So this just historically has been the way that agriculture has happened. So many of our agricultural products are non-native, though we do have some native ones that I'll talk about today. 
Um, and many of these native ones might just be very culturally tied. So you might not see them in the grocery stores or maybe they don't store as well as some of our other products. So they don't get to travel as far of a distance from the farm to your plate. Um, many of these crops are fairly specialty crops, like I said, so they might be something that one culture versus another might tend to eat more of, or they could potentially be a product that really you just grow at home, you eat it at home, and maybe you share it with your neighbors, you don't necessarily buy it in the stores. Um, and many of these products, too, are also made into something else. So jams and wines are two of the most common ones for some of these native plants. How are these native crops managed? Well, that's really what we're going to get into today when we talk about some of the examples of our native crops. And I just want to highlight the plant needs going back to the basics. Plants need light, they need air, they need water, and they need soil and nutrients. And for those of you who are all too familiar with our native plants, you will know that the native conditions where they are growing tend to be good or just right to be able to grow those plants. And focusing on that a little bit more, I do want to talk about water and soil and nutrients as that relates to producing our plants, especially here in Florida. Starting with the topic of water, this is one that I am very, very passionate about, and I like to include in any class I teach a little bit about the water that goes behind our food production. We all know that water is very critical to our daily lives. We drink water and we use water in the household, whether it's brushing our teeth, washing dishes, what have you. But what we tend to forget about is how much water goes into the food we are eating. It took a lot of water to produce the food that was on your plate for dinner tonight, or if you haven't quite eaten yet, the dinner you're going to be eating after this presentation. And just an example of that is one watermelon takes about 310 gallons of water to produce. So something about this big is taking way more water just to be sweet, delicious, and on your table. Um, in addition to that, another example I like to use is a cup of coffee. Many people think that one cup of coffee means it took one cup of water to produce that coffee. And the way you see it, that's probably how it was because you poured that coffee into your coffee maker, you added your cup of wa water, ran it through, and got your one cup of coffee. But behind that coffee, there was a lot of water that went into the production of those coffee beans, as well as the making of the packaging, the moving of that product. Water is used at every single step. So it is really important for us to understand that while we might think we're conserving water, we do also have to think about all the water going into our food products. Really the reason for that is water is a limited resource. We're very, very thankful here in Florida to not have quite as many problems as other parts of the US and other parts of the world when it comes to water. But that doesn't mean we can just continue to use water at a very high rate. There will be a point in the future where there is not enough water to go around. And we do see fights happening and arguments happening surrounding water to this day. In other parts of the world too, accessibility to safe drinking water, water to produce those crops is hard to come by. They don't have the technologies to be able to purify that water or the water sources that are quite as clean as we are fortunate to have here in Florida. The demand for water is high all over the place. And I like to use this graphic here of the homeowners, the farmers, and all the other entities playing tug of war on who gets to use the water. And so the homeowners want to water their lawn, they want to wash their dishes, they want to shower, wash their clothes, they want to drink straight from the faucet. The farmers want to use that water to produce our food and all those other entities that need water for one reason or another. That's the constant battle on whose needs are most important. 
But in reality, it's all of our jobs to help conserve water so that we can continue to put food on the table and we can continue to have that access to water to make our lives happy and healthy. Um, and quantity is really important and so is quality. As we continue to see the population grow, we will continue to see this struggle for the amount of water there. And in Florida alone, this is kind of a really cool estimation by the Central Florida Water Initiative. And I say cool, but it's actually kind of scary. So we know that in the state of Florida, we are currently using about 800 millions of gallons per day of water. So that's a lot of water right off the bat. But the concerning part is what we think we will need as the population continues to rise and as we continue to use water in the future. We project that by 2035, and it seems like a ways away, but it's just around the corner, that we need an additional 300 millions of gallons of water per day. Unfortunately, what we are able to make available based on our current water resources is estimated at about only 50 millions of gallons of water per day. What that means is based on our projected needs, we are going to not have enough water to satisfy those needs. So this is really current, it's in the very near future, and it's something we all should be thinking about because when it goes back to that agriculture, it goes back to we're using that water for a lot of different things we're using it to produce our food, which is kind of the perspective that I'm taking on today in talking about this topic. And I did mention quality already too. What is the problem with our water? Just because the water is there does not mean it is readily usable, safe to drink and all of that. Our available water that we do have can still become polluted and we've seen increasing problems with this, especially due to nutrient leaching, nutrient runoffs um, from all sorts of sources. So it's not that there is one person in particular to blame for this problem. A lot of it is just small issues by all the different individuals that add up together to cause problems with our water sources. It's really, really expensive to fix the problem of water and clean it once it is a mess. So that's really critical to think about. And a lot of times it's excess fertilizer, whether it's from the yard, it's from agricultural operations or golf, um, golf courses, wherever there is fertilizer being applied, there's the potential for that to run off into our water bodies, have that high level of nutrients and lead to nasty stuff like this algae or crazy um, outgrowths of plants in our water bodies too. And looking at this in the urban area, there are a lot of different sources to contamination of our water. It's not just fertilizers. We also have pet waste. Um, even the stormwater itself can sometimes bring with it different contaminants. Um, and there's other things like motor oils, soaps from washing your cars, anything that runs off. And if you've ever seen Florida after a heavy rain, you can see that water taking with it whatever was on top of the street or whatever was on that sidewalk with it. So a lot of different things contributing to that. Pesticides are another thing that could potentially impact our water bodies. And it's like I mentioned already, all of our jobs to help protect those water sources and help protect our ability to produce our food into the future. I mentioned this once already, but how native crops are managed are fairly unique in that they require less inputs. They don't require as much watering, they don't require as much fertilization, and even the pests and pathogens aren't nearly as bad as some of our non-native plants. So this can be really important when we think about managing our plants because we are saving time, saving money, and they tend to be just a little bit happier of plants in general in their current conditions, and that's because they're native. Um, all of you know this already, that those plants are gonna tend to do better in their native environment. Um, and so we won't have all these extra inputs. 
Um, some of the easiest to grow native food plants are ones that do really well in our sandy soils. They don't have a lot of pests and pathogen pre um, prevalence. And today I do want to talk a little bit about some of these. So some that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on the production um, some of these being commercially produced and some of these being fairly locally produ produced or perhaps a garden plant. I'm going to look at muscadine grapes a little bit, and that tends to be a lot of people's favorites because it's often produced into wines and jams. I'll talk about blueberries. We have quite a bit of blueberry production here in the state of Florida. Persimmons is another one that we have a few producers, especially commercial commercial producers here in the state and throughout the rest of the United States too. And then we'll talk a little bit about mulberries too, which is just one of my personal favorites. So starting off, I do want to talk about muscadines and wine. Let's start off with one of the high value commercially produced um, types of native agricultural crops. Muscadine grapes are native to the southeastern U.S., though this is not the only kind of grape that we produce here in the U.S. There are other European types of grapes that we will produce. Muscadines are typically the more easy growing, easy to grow, and they have less problems than some of our other grape varieties. Um, they tend to grow in USDA hardiness zones 7 through 9. So for those of you in Central Florida, that does cover our area fairly well. We're in about 9B here in Seminole County. And many people will have these in their backyard, though there are commercial vineyards that will produce muscadines too. Some popular varieties that people will use in Central Florida are fry. This is one of our fresh market varieties, so you can actually eat the grapes themselves. They don't necessarily have to be turned into a wine. Um, and then we also have Carlos, Pollyanna, and Southern Home, which are some other common varieties that are grown here in Central Florida. The fun thing about grapes is you do have to do some training. So just like training a dog, you do have to train your grapes to behave as they are growing. Um, so typically they grow to the size of whatever trellis you are training them to. So that might be about... Um, 12 to 15 feet per row and 10 to 15 feet between those rows are the spacing you're going to want to keep. You probably won't get decent yields until about one to two years after planting. I would err on expecting some good grapes at about two years and beyond. Um, but this is one of our faster growing agricultural crops. Um, some, some of these plants, if you plant them from seed, especially some of our native crops, it could be up to 10 years before you actually see fruit. Um, so it's really a long investment. We tend to propagate our plants vegetatively to get them going a little bit quicker. And that same thing is true for our muscadine grapes. We oftentimes propagate them vegetatively. One of the good things about our muscadine grapes is that most of them can survive freezing temperatures. Um, so we don't have to worry about that too much in central Florida, though we do get the occasional freeze. We're continuing to get warmer and warmer. Um, muscadines are best grown in full sun and they like well-drained soils. And thankfully here in Florida, we have super sandy, well-drained soils. So they really like that. Um, they do not like to be in very swampy conditions, so there are parts of Florida or like low-lying areas where some people might try to produce muscadines, but they won't do very well there. They need to be well-drained. Um, but they do have moderate drought tolerance, so in the times of the years where we get slightly less rain, so in our drier season, they do fairly well and require very limited irrigation. And I alluded to this already where we do tend to propagate those muscadines vegetatively. So we might be doing cuttings. This is the most common type of propagation for our muscadines where they make a node um, cutting. So you take two to three node long little pieces. Um, about a quarter inch to three eighths inch thick is what you're going to be looking for. And you can even dip them in a little bit of rooting hormone before sticking them in some moist soil. And they'll kind of do their own thing. As long as you keep that soil moist, moist they'll be able to root on their own. 
Um, like with a lot of our agricultural commodities, the seeds are not true to type. So if you try to plant them from the seed, you have no idea what you're going to get. And like I mentioned already, it may take quite a long time before you see that plant ever producing fruit if you're planting from seed. When you're transplanting them, you do want to do your bare root vines, plant them about December to February, or if they're container grown, you can do it throughout the year. Though I will say for commercial production, a lot of this is going to be planted, those bare root vines. Um, container grown is a little bit more specialty, and it really depends on the specific grower. I mentioned that you do have to train your grapes and the most common type of training that people are going to do is a um, bilateral cordon or a single cordon. So you have the main trunk going up and then you train those cordons along the two sides of a trellis. Um, so it's really critical to get that going early on. You are going to have to let that main trunk grow, keep it pruned, let it keep growing till it hits the trellis, and then train it along the sides with some continued pruning year after year. What that schedule typically looks like is pruning during those dormant periods where the plants are not growing very much. That's mid-January to mid-March is going to be the best time to do that. Um, and you want to leave a couple nodes per spur so you can see a nice after-pruned branch here on the right hand side versus the unpruned on the left. So leaving a couple nodes, two to four um, per spur. And if that cord starts to lose its vigor, so after about ten, five to 10 years, it'll start to slow down and maybe die back a little bit. You can remove that one and let a new young shoot start to grow. So keeping that same trunk, but training a new cord on to continue to grow. So it's a little bit of work and year after year, you'll have to keep continuing to play with your muscadines to keep them well-trained and continuing to grow the way we want them to. So here's just some pictures of what that would actually look like in the field. You have your first year of pruning where the plant is very young. It had reached the top of the trellis and you'd started to train the cordons down along the side. Sometimes you might need to help them and keep them tied on a little bit. And then that mature vine, this one's definitely in need of pruning during the dormant season once those leaves and the fruit have all been removed. The leaves dropped on, off on their own. Pollination is a little bit more interesting in grapes. So for those of you who are not familiar with this concept, um, some of our grapes are gonna be pistillate, which are meaning they're only female, and some of them are gonna be self-fertile. So in order to grow these grapes, you either need to have pistillate with self-fertile nearby, or you can have just self-fertile varieties, though cross-pollination with multiple cultivars is most likely going to get you better fruit. Um, so you'll have higher yields and healthier looking fruit coming off of those plants. Just in general, those self-fertile varieties do tend to have higher yields, um, though some of those pistillate female varieties are desirable, so you might try to interspace them or interplant them with some other cultivars. Trying to make sure I catch the comments too, they're scrolling fast. So I wanna make sure I can get any questions in as well. Um, fertilization and irrigation, like I mentioned with some of our native plants already, they tend to like the conditions here in Florida pretty well. The soil pH in Florida, depending on where you are, 5.5 to 6.5 is ideal, though there are certain pockets within Florida that tend to have a little bit more alkaline or a higher pH soil. So we really just recommend doing a soil test before planting any of these. For the commercial producers, they're likely gonna do this well before they establish their grove. And also, um, in addition, they might have annual soil testing to make sure they're still within that ideal range. They really, the muscadine grapes require small amounts of fertilizer. For those of you who are just growing them in your backyard for fun, 
they're really not going to need a whole lot of fertilization. So within that first year, you're not putting more than a third of a pound on the plants. And you really want to space that out and kind of dump small amounts at a time. And within the second year, you can up that once they start to produce a lot more fruit. But compared to some of our other agricultural commodities, these inputs are fairly low. Um, and irrigation is kind of the same story where you irrigate regularly during the establishment if it's not already raining like it does, especially in the rainy season here in Florida. And if it's really, really dry May through June and you have any amounts of fruit on those plants, that's just um, if your plants are fruiting, they probably need a little bit more water. And if it's not raining, it would be good to irrigate a little bit. One of the biggest pests of muscadine grapes is actually just other plants. So maintaining a weed-free zone, which you'll see this as a theme throughout some of the native plants that we're talking about today, um, maintaining that weed-free zone is really critical to having higher yields because those weeds are competing for resources. It's competing for the fertilizer that's there. It's competing for the water that's there. And the young plants are really the ones that are most sensitive to the weeds. The reason for that is because they are so close to the ground, they are small, they are struggling to get up to that trellis. When you have weeds nearby, they're competing for light in addition to just that nutrients and irrigation. So really with muscadines, our young plants require the most management when it comes to weeds. There are some pests of muscadine, but really our muscadines are pretty hardy. They can handle a lot of different things. Um, so some of the problems that you can occasionally see in grapes are the grape root borer. You might have aphids, chili thrips. And I also mentioned the glassy wing sharpshooter here because this is a particular concern because it can transmit a bacteria to grapes. Um, Pierce's disease is that bacteria, if anyone's familiar, though that is mainly a problem in our European type grapes. We don't see it so much being a problem in our muscadines. Our muscadines, like I mentioned, they're native. They're pretty hardy against some of the pests and pathogens we have here in Florida. <laughs> really, I would say our biggest pest of muscadine grapes, as well as many of our other fruit crops, specifically our animals, and sneaky little creatures that like to get to our products before we're able to harvest them. There are a lot of different pathogens, though, like I mentioned already, muscadines are pretty hardy against these, but I do mention these because sometimes people are growing both muscadines and European varieties of grapes. First and foremost, just pick a variety that is disease resistant. If you know you've had a problem historically, pick one that does better against some of these pathogens. Um, you wanna train your grapes for good airflow. A lot of our pathogen problems result just because there's not enough air moving through that plant to keep it dry. If those plants are staying too wet after a morning dew or after a, a Florida storm, they can lead to rots, leaf spots, and some of these funky looking things on the screen here. But as far as management goes, management is pretty straightforward in muscadines. We try to prevent the problem just by doing a lot of pruning, proper pruning, and removing any heavily infested plants or heavily infested dead looking wood on those vines. And as I mentioned at the start of this, muscadines are very famous for that muscadine wine, especially here in the state of Florida and throughout the South. Um, those varieties that are best for wines and making into jellies are Alachua, Carlos, which is one that's commonly grown here in Central Florida, Noble and Welder. And wine and is a little bit different of a process than our jams and jelly, but the basic thing is there is that you are adding sugar. So for wine, you're mashing those grapes, getting the juice and straining it, adding sugar, water, and some yeast to ferment it. With our jams and jelly, you're just adding even more sugar than you did with the wine. You can put in those fresh mus muscadines or cook them down, strain them however you best like it. I've done it a couple different varieties. Um, and then, of course, pectin. 
And I see some stuff popping into the chat here. How do we keep down competition from other native plants, dare I say weeds, while at the same time keeping biodiversity and an otherwise healthy habitat? Well, that's a really good question. Um, it kind of goes back to having, if for example, you're doing this in your yard, different areas where you have different things going on. Um, it won't hurt the plants to have some other native weeds, for example, along the bottom. It just might mean you are getting less fruit or you are getting smaller fruit. If you're doing this commercially, you'd probably want to do a little bit more management to keep those weeds away and potentially have areas surrounding your vineyard that have some of those native flowers that pollinators really like and stuff like that. So it's all about finding a balance there. And a lot of our producers will have those bordering areas maintained in a way that they are not overtaking the vineyard, but they're still promoting pollinators, natural enemies, and giving them a good space to hang out while keeping that biodiversity around and near the farm. So that does bring me to the topic of blueberries and let me make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat here. I think, I think I'm mostly caught up, but we'll start in on blueberries. Um, this is one that is a, he Oops. I'm scrolling here, sorry about that. This is one that there is a lot of commercial production. I would say more commercial production than we see just small scale production of um, where this has long been one of our big crops in the state. And that's because many of those varieties are native to North America. And so we have a lot of different types of blueberries here. Um, for those of you who have been to Northern Florida, you might even see wild blueberry plants. We have some areas here in Central Florida too, but I'm very familiar with the wild blueberries that we had in um, North Florida where I used to live. Um, I see a couple more things popping up before I move on to blueberries. Do muscadine fruits tend to split if a heavy rain occurs after light irrigation schedules? So that is one that we do see with a lot of our fruits. If they get too much water all at once, it goes back to making sure that that soil is well drained. Um, so we see this a lot with tomatoes, for example. If they get too much water all at once, they can kind of split. Same is true for our muscadines. They can split after a heavy rain, but just having good, well-drained soils in that area can be important to keeping them from doing that. Let me see, did I miss any other ones that scrolled down? All right, I think we're good. Wait, nope, got them all, awesome. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to keep up with the chat and to keep up with the, the presentation. I got a couple different monitors going on. But moving into blueberries here, they are a small to medium sized shrub. Some of our southern high bush, the ones that are going to be our native plants. Um, we also have rabbit eye cultivars that are sometimes grown here in Florida. Really depends on the goal of the producer. I would say our southern high bush are going to be more of our high value ones that a lot of the commercial production tends to, to go towards. So some of those varieties are Emerald, Jewel, Star, Windsor, Spring High, Sweet Crisp, Farthing, and like I mentioned already, Rabbit Eye is also another one sometimes grown. Emerald is one that is really popular here in Central Florida, and that's because it has really high yield and early ripening, so it can kind of avoid some of those pest problems that some of our other varieties might get later in the season. And some of these are susceptible to different pests and pathogens. So this does have a little bit higher of that management for pests and pathogens than what we saw with our last crop and what we'll see with some of the other ones we're talking about today. The size of those plants depends on the cultivar. So it could be anywhere from four to 15 feet high, four to 10 feet spread. And sometimes the pruning is really what matters in keeping it to a specific size and shape too. After you plant these, you can expect decent yields in about three to five years. Um, so these are ones that can take a little bit to get up and going off the ground and producing fruit. The unique thing about the blueberries is um, compared to some of our other agricultural crops, they do like a pH that is a little bit more acidic 
than our other plants. So they like 4.5 to 5.5. So certain parts of Florida, this is not going to be ideal for if you have a more alkaline type of soil. And so as far as management goes, like I said, blueberries are a little bit more picky. You might have to do some adjusting to try and keep that soil pH a little bit lower too. And they like a little bit of organic matter in there. So really, really sandy parts of the states not going to be ideal unless you have one of our varieties that do better in those conditions. They do have a chill requirement. So that chill requirement, having a little bit of cold is all right for our blueberries, but anything below 21 degrees Fahrenheit can kill those flowers. Um, so if there's flowers, it may not necessarily kill the plant, but you won't get fruit out of those flowers if you do have a freeze. So freeze protection is important. There are ways that growers can help protect their crops from freezes during a really cold night or a couple cold nights in a row. They do like to be in full sun. They like to be in full sun, but they can also handle partial shade for production too. And some of cultivars are better when it comes to drought than others. So if we get a period of no rain, those rabbit eye varieties are gonna be a little bit better at surviving drought than some of the other varieties. But like we saw with our last crop, our muscadines, they do need well-drained soils. They don't like to be in standing water. Um, planting, like I mentioned already, it does require some, some adjustments. It might need a little bit of pH adjustment to make that soil a little bit more acidic. And pine bark is one of those organic matter medium that might be added to our blueberry planting to slightly bring down the pH and bring up that organic matter. Um, when you're planting, use a plant that's about 1.5 to 2 feet tall and something with a well-developed root system before you put it into the ground. And when you do plant, you are going to want to do a little bit of pruning, and this is just going to help that plant establish and make sure that we do have a timeline, three to five years we start to see fruit from it. So focusing a little bit on that pruning, there are different methods in which you might choose to prune. And sometimes it just depends on who you're selling to, your time commitment, the equipment you have, and how many plants you have too. So there is the vase method, which is common for people doing this by hand, where they might kind of keep this V shape in the plant. That's to allow good airflow in the plant so that we have fewer incidents of pests and pathogens. For our commercial producers, a lot of times when they have a lot of plants, they're using a topping method that's just kind of going over the top to keep that shape, keep that size, not let them grow out of control. Um, but this is a process, like I said, you do it at planting and then you will do this pruning annually to keep the plants from getting out of control. You want to prune right after harvest, so after those berries are coming off the plant in the early summers, you're going to go through and do that after season maintenance so that the plants are ready to go for the next season. Um, blueberries are one that pollinators are definitely a concern because they do require quite a bit of pollination. Um, so sometimes when people are not getting very good amounts of fruit on their blueberries, it might be because they're not getting enough pollinators. So it goes back to talking about making sure there are areas for those pollinators to hang out, for those pollinators to be happy, and so that they stay in the farm. And we make sure that the native pollinators especially are in the area. Um, so I've actually seen where blueberry producers will hire beekeepers to help promote bees in the area, whether they're bringing in colonies or helping them to kind of establish more native um, pollinators in the, the areas where they're producing blueberries too. If you are thinking about grow, growing blueberries at home, do know that you need at least two plants for good pollination. Um, so that cross-pollination with multiple cultivars especially will get you more fruit than having just one. Or if your neighbors have a couple varieties too, this is also super helpful. 
Um, so just doing stuff to encourage those pollinators throughout the year when the blueberry plants are not flowering, you need to have something else to help those pollinators survive in those intermediate times where there are no blueberry plants. One very critical thing with our blueberries is for those working especially in commercial groves to avoid using pesticides when the pollinators are out and about in the field. So there are a lot of good practices to best protect our pollinators, especially in blueberry fields, and many of those growers will attend training specifically on this. So I actually talked about this in one of my train or one of my producer focused classes earlier today where we talk about our best practices for avoiding hurting our pollinators in on the farms. Um, blueberry fertilization can be tricky because it goes back to that soil pH, though some cultivars do better in Florida than others. Many times they're using a blueberry special fertilizer or something that's like a camellia azalea Azalea fertilizer can also be used for blueberries, but it's basically got your major nutrients, your NPK and magnesium, and the commercial operators will get pretty specific and do regular soil testing or even leaf tissue analysis to make sure that their fertilizer is on point with what they're doing. Um, but very small amounts for those of you growing them in your backyard and those growers are applying small amounts um, in a regular and very, very regulated way and making sure to continue to test as they're doing that. Irrigation, for the most part, we get enough rain, except in that dry season from December to March, your plants might need a little bit more water or if the, there's fruit on the plants, especially they need that water, but small amounts of water tend to do the job for the most part and we get plenty of rain throughout the rest of the year for blueberries. Like I mentioned with our muscadines, we still wanna talk about maintaining a weed-free zone underneath the bushes. These guys get pretty big and they shade out a lot of things from underneath them anyways, but the younger the plant, the more critical that area underneath the plant is going to be. For our commercial producers, they might use herbicides in that area underneath the plant and they're doing an application to protect the plant and only apply it in that specific area they're looking at. Some of the major pests of blueberries are actually ones that might not necessarily be from Florida. Um, so we've seen problems with increasing invasive species in blueberry production in the United States. Um, but some of the common pests and the ones listed on IFAS documents include blueberry gull midge, blueberry bud mite, and both flower and chili thrips being the main concerns for our commercial producers. There is an array of different blueberry pathogens, but some of them go back to just preventing the introduction of that pathogen to the field in the first place. So our producers want to make sure they are receiving clean stock that their plants are coming in without problems already um, and completely removing any plants that are heavily infected um, and really just focusing on integrated pest management, prevention being that critical step to introducing a lot of our pathogens into blueberries. So check the chat real quick, see if we have anything else see some people chatting in there. Now we'll talk a little bit about persimmons. And this is a plant that is fairly new to my knowledge base of agriculture. Um, so I worked a lot with a lot of our big crops. Per persimmons is one that some of our local producers tend to grow. And with persimmons, we have both native and non-native types here in the United States. Um, so the common persimmons is the native one that I'll talk about. And then we have our non-native Japanese persimmons as well. Um, a lot of them are grown side by side, but sometimes you see that common one even growing wild in certain areas. We have another native one to Texas too, but that's the Texas persimmons. And it's typically grown as a landscape shrub and not really grown for the production of fruit. So for those of you who are not familiar with persimmons, I do wanna give you a little bit of a lesson on the different types of persimmons out there. We have both astringent and non-astringent varieties of persimmons. 
And the astringent ones you can see here on the right, they are soft, squishy, and they almost feel like a balloon when you touch it. Um, they have tannins in them that absorb the proteins on your tongue and almost give you a dehydration sensation when you're eating them. But they're super sweet and extra delicious. When you eat them, though, you want to make sure they're extra squishy, they're soft, um, and in some cases, when these are being processed, they might be artificially treated to remove that kind of astringency and those tannins that cause that dehydration feeling. Um, tannins are basically like in unripe bananas, unripe persimmons, and other fruits. And that's kind of that weird texture you get when you're eating them and almost this weird feeling on your tongue. The non-astringent ones, however, can be eaten when they're still pretty hard. So they're crisp, almost like biting into an apple, and you can allow them to ripen fully. Um, these ones are, tend to be easier for the commercial producers because they can actually be shipped. Um, they're not as easily bruised as the astringent varieties or poked into. They're easy um, to harvest. You just throw them and they're not going to cause as many problems. Uh, and these ones tend to be harvested by color. So once the color hits a certain tone, that's when they're rated and ready to go. Um, but looking at the difference between those two, you can see that balloon squishiness in our astringent and our um, much thicker looking, almost apple-like non-astringent varieties. The common persimmons is going to be an astringent only type. Um, so these are the ones that we see throughout the United States, and we see them pretty frequently here in central Florida, too. They can grow up to 60 feet tall and about 20 to 35 feet wide. So they're a really, really big tree if the producer lets them get that big. The fruit is about 1.5 to 2 inches, so they're kind of tiny. Um, and compared to some of the Japanese varieties, they're a little bit smaller. They can have a wide range of flavors, um, and they grow well in quite a few different environments. They like the sandy soil. They do fairly decent in lots of different pH soils, and they don't require a lot of nutrient inputs. For our common persimmons, you do have to have both the male and the female trees to have proper fruiting. Um, in general, they're pretty pest resistant, though from time to time we do get some leaf spot disease on them. And that's really in the south that we see that, where it's really humid, which can limit the production of common persimmons versus the Japanese persimmons. And as I already alluded to, that Japanese persimmons, that's one that's commonly grown in central Florida. Um, we have a couple commercial producers here in the central Florida area. The astringent and non-astringent types can be found with Japanese persimmons that, again, that astringent being the soft jelly water balloon texture and that non-astringent being crisp like an apple. There's a couple different shapes. So you can see the conical shape here. We have one that's a little bit more round like that common persimmons variety and one that's kind of oblate. In general, persimmons can be planted in a lot of different areas. We saw that big map already of where they can be um, where they can be planted in the United States. And 9B is kind of the limit much further south than that, and they're not going to do as well. They do require full sun, well-drained soils, and you plant them early in the spring in the dormant season. More often than not, growers are going to be using a grafting strategy to plant these, um, and that's because those seeds are not true. So like we saw with our muscadines, it's very, very common for our fruit production to not hold true to seed. So grafting and other vegetative propagation is really the direction we go to make sure we know what we're getting so that we don't end up wasting a couple years waiting for the fruit to show up for it to be not so tasty or to be not a very good variety. When it comes to pruning, you're really looking at removing the dead or dying branches, removing any diseased branches. You want to do this early in the spring or late in the winter during dormancy. So this is when the, fruit, the tree is not producing those fruit. You keep a central leader and then have branches that are not overlapping or crossing. 
Um, and you might even need to prune a little bit when the plants are fruiting, just because those fruits are so juicy and heavy. If you have too many fruit on a branch, it can very easily snap the branch. Like we saw with some of our other native plants, fertilization and irrigation with this one is pretty straightforward and easy. Actually, over fertilization can lead to more problems in persimmons than the under fertilization. So really, really small amounts of fertilizer, less than a half a pound of fertilizer per tree. So that's a really small amount compared to some of the other food crops that are in production. And then you might need irrigation when establishing those plants or if there is a time where there is drought and the plants are still fruiting, they might need a little bit of water as well. There are very few pests and pathogens of our persimmons and the ones that are there are kind of just really annoying and can be a problem on individual farms or individual sites. Um, but we have persimmon borers, which are both moths and we have some beetles as well. But in general, they're fairly minor pest problems. That leaf spot is the one I mentioned with our common persimmons, our native type of persimmons, that in the south, when it's really, really hot and humid, you see that spotting. And even then, our plants do tend to do fairly well to survive through it. But the further south you get, the harder it will be to produce those persimmons. And the last one I'm going to talk about today is really a quick one. This is just another one I wanted to add. It's not very frequently grown commercially. Sometimes at local markets, you might see some value added products like jellies and jams with mulberries. But this is just a very, very easy, low maintenance plant that is really easy to include into your garden. And it is also one of our native species. Mulberries thrive in infertile soil, so sandy soil with very little fertilization, you should probably plant some mulberries because they're going to do just fine. And they are constantly producing fruit. We have one right outside our office that is producing fruit several times a year and producing so much fruit that we're happy eating the mulberries, the birds are happy eating the mulberries, and it's a really just hardy drought tolerant plant. They have moderate wind resistance, so they're kind of these long, lengthy, little um, branches of the plant that does pretty well in wind, especially if you're maintaining it and pruning it properly. And then fallen fruits are sometimes a concern if you can't pick them fast enough. They do tend to leave this little um, purplish residue on surfaces. but. In general, really easy. They don't require a lot of input. You can pretty much ignore them and they will continue to do their thing and produce a lot of berries. And I do want to clarify here that this is very different than the invasive paper mulberry. So that is a category two invasive. And the one we're talking about here is a red mulberry. Very, very different plant, um, though the names are so, so similar. Planting mulberries is really easy, so if you know someone that has a mulberry plant or if you're visiting the Seminole County office, feel free to take a little cutting of our plant. Um, all you need is about two nodes of that plant. You can cut off all the leaves and stick it in moist soil, maybe dip it in root, rooting hormone, but it'll still do its thing without the rooting hormone. Um, but one single branch, even a large branch, can make a ton of different cuttings and continue to provide mulberry plants to many other people. I have a habit of over-propagating them and ending up with so many cuttings that I don't know what to do with them. One of the good varieties and the one that we have outside of our office is a dwarf ever-bearing variety of that red mulberry. It's has a large crop in the spring, but like I said, it continues to produce throughout the year. So we have smaller productions of berries. We're still getting berries. I actually was just eating some off of the tree last week when I was standing outside and talking on the phone. So you continue to see that fruit throughout the year. Um, it does get cold enough that the leaves might drop off, but it does bounce back again in the early spring. As far as maintenance goes, you can perform some light pruning. Um, and that's really just to keep the branches from snapping if it does get too windy. Um, provide good airflow in your plant as well. But you really just cut out the dead or dying 
um, and it does pretty good on its own. Um, just know when you are handling this plant, it can have a milky sap that comes out when you're cutting, and that can irritate some people. It can irritate the skin, but otherwise it is a fairly straightforward and easy plant to deal with. So that was just that last little bit on mulberries, and that is not the only agricultural plants that we have that are native. We also have beautyberry, we have wild coffee, sea grapes, and even swamp cabbage. These ones don't tend to be grown commercially, and wild coffee is one that not a lot of people will eat, but they might have it as an ornamental plant. And so there's a lot of other cool native things out there, but like I started in the beginning of this presentation, not all of them are grown commercially. It might be one or two plants in the backyard, or it might be, for example, swamp cabbage, um, something that is actually out in the woods. Um, so there's a lot of different native things, and native plants do have their place and role in our agriculture here in Florida. And I hope this was a good introduction to a lot of that. And I know I barely scratched the surface of a lot of the management, and it was a brief introduction. But I hope you all enjoyed um, what I had to say about some of these crops and what I had to say about our local agriculture, because it is a huge part of our economy. It's a really, really cool topic, and it's something that I just love talking about. I can see that. Morgan, blown us away. Thank you so much for, gosh, what a wonderful presentation. I can't even begin to express my gratitude. Thank you so much for putting a wonderful, insightful, comprehensive presentation, how to even plant these natives and uh, how to grow them and how to be patient um, because your rewards are not going to be, you know, the next season. It takes years. Um, <clears throat> so Kaylee Adams, uh, your your fan mail is already coming in, Morgan. So great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank and I you. do see we have another question. Um, Amy asked, yeah. Are there any you pick operations for persimmons? Yeah. Yes, we have one locally in Seminole County. Um, Lake Mills you pick um, is one of the ones we have locally. I personally love them, but I highly encourage you to check them out yourself. Um, and then I believe there are some in neighboring counties if you're located in a different part of the state, but that is one of those specialty crops that you picks tend to do well with. Um, are the persimmons and something that people might just be excited to go out and try um, and see in the field. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, people are loving this presentation, I can tell. I think anybody would love a presentation that speaks to their stomach, right? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> like I said yes. in the beginning, that's how I ended up in agriculture is my love of food and wanting to know where my food came from. And Amen. I hope I can share that with others too. Amen. I think you did. You accomplished that with flying colors tonight. Uh, folks, if you have questions, now is a good time to put them in the chat. If you're on YouTube or Facebook Live, uh, please go ahead and comment. We can pick those up. We can post them into the live stream and Morgan will be happy to give you some of her feedback. So uh, Rory is our one of our members. Um, he's actually in Seminole County. So Rory, don't, uh, don't be a stranger. Morgan is part of Seminole IFAS. You can come say hello. And hopefully once the pandemic subsides, uh, things will come back to normal. Yeah. Yeah. You know where to find me, the local office. And I did write down the yes. December 13th event. If I oh, we would stop love by, to I have you. <laughs> we would love to have you. We're going to send out our invites. And folks, if you are hearing this December 13th, open invitation to a couple of firm members, friends and family. Please come enjoy the merriment. Tina has been there, your colleague, and she enjoyed our games and uh, we're just going to build on that and make it even better this year. And it's going to be our first time, uh, our membership. This is our first time meeting all together um, since COVID happened. So it's been it's been a really long time. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed uh, everything will work out and stay on target. Um, I had some questions, folks. Uh, do not hesitate. If you have questions, please post them in the chat box. But in the meantime, uh, I will ask some questions for you, Morgan. Mm -hmm. Native muscadines, uh, I, I, I know you had touched based on that. Maybe I missed it. Are the ones that are in cultivation dioecious, meaning they have 
male and female uh, flowers on the same plant? Hmm, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I don't think I can remember. Um, I don't know with specifically the muscadines. I know it's specific to the individual cult cultivar. Gotcha. And I'm not as familiar with the muscadines because a lot of our commercial production does still try to integrate a lot of the European varieties. Mm -hmm. um, if I can find that out, I will follow up with you on that. Sure, sure. Um, and where where do you buy muscadines? So we see a lot of them in the store. I'm not the only one that has tried to grow them from seed, but now I realize that, you know, that's like a decades long investment. So mm -hmm. maybe I should get a cutting. So where do you recommend getting uh, muscadine clippings and maybe mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, you know, trying a, a grape out to see if that's the fruit you want? Uh, before you get a clipping of it or you get a sapling of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. They can be hard to come by. Um, I don't know any nurseries off the top of my head locally that would have muscadines, um, though I, there could potentially be some. Um, I would take a quick search on um, the internet because sometimes when we have uh, vineyards that do produce muscadines, they might also sell some of those cuttings. So that would be a good place to start is to look up if there's any vineyards selling cuttings specifically. Because um, like you said, seeds, who knows what you're going to get. And it's going to be quite a while before you see it's anything. Be a long from them too. It's going to be a <laughs> yeah. long way. Yes. Um, native persons. My next question. Mm -hmm. uh, are they astringent um, or are they, are they the water balloon effect? I mean, the water balloon effect is astringent um so that's yeah so i'm asking yes. one of the same thing are um, they astringent? yeah i believe the native ones are supposed to be the astringent type um and that's one of those that again is kind of propagated by people sharing cuttings of mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. grafting it um mm -hmm. so there, there's even some confusion when people are producing them as to what yes. variety they're actually growing um, some of them yes. might think it's the native and it's not. Um, so the, a, the production is very similar. And what an amazing tip you gave us to plant them in the spring. So whenever we get a, a clipping that is shared or if we get maybe even a runner. So our native uh, persimums uh, can sucker heavily. So if you get a runner uh, or a sucker, you need to plant them in the spring. Great tip, Morgan. Thank you. Yeah, no um, problem. Native mulberry, my next question. Mm -hmm. um, so the one at Seminole Ifus is the native kind. I thought it was um, maybe, because maybe it looked like a dwarf, I thought maybe it, it was the Japanese mulberry, but I was curious about that. Can you tell me a little bit more about the plant that's mm -hmm. <laughs> at yeah. the office? Um, I was under the impression that that one is actually the native. Um, that's the one that we, I know Tina has also done a lot of cuttings from that plant and we do talk to people pretty regularly about mulberries um, and it's just so easy to propagate. Um, it's not one, at least that specific plant that's going to take over um, with a little bit of common pruning. Um, it's not going to cause any problems in your yard or anything like that. Gotcha. And where can people, if they're not close to Seminole Ifas, where can people purchase uh, native mulberry? Should they be interested? That is another one that is hard to come by at some of the <laughs> nurseries. Um, I, I would say it probably most likely gets shared around just word of mouth, yeah. people that have a plant. Um, but they're, you're not going to find them too frequently unless you're specifically <laughs> going to a place that sells those mm -hmm. native plants. So, so moral of the story, guys, is when you when you see a plant person in, in the crowd, make sure you're friends with them. <laughs> yeah, and I, of course, plant people just love to share their plants too. You so go. you wouldn't have any problem getting cuttings from other people. There you go. There you go. Um, question about persimmons and mulberries. Their true forms are rather large, sixty feet. Mulberries can attain 80 feet easily, especially mm -hmm. if they're close to fresh water or the water table is relatively high. Uh, is um, with trees with a central line, how do how does a gardener or are there any tips or recommendations 
uh, to keep them shorter than their natural height, their natural tendency to be that tall? Is there um, an easy way for someone to kind of control them so that they're not gargantuan? Um, yeah, the, the best thing is kind of train, it's kind of like training those grapes where you almost have to train it to stay a little bit smaller. Um, when you're cutting down and topping the plant a little bit, it'll kind of naturally start to branch out more. So then it becomes your job to keep it from branching too much as well, because um, then it can get too heavy. Those branches can snap, especially if they start to cross over each other. Um, so the plant is going to naturally keep trying to grow yeah. and you're yeah. going to train it, keep <laughs> it small, crazy. and it'll continue awesome. to produce that fruit as much as it can. <laughs> That's right. We have a question from Amy. Amy writes, mm -hmm. is blackberry commercially cultivated in Florida? Um, if it is, it's very, very small production. It's going to be very individual growers that might do it on the side. Um, it's not one that I have come across very often. Like blueberries, you find a lot of blueberry producers, but black mulberry is not something I see very regularly. Um, I, I don't know of anyone in Central Florida that would be specifically doing anything like that. Yeah, gotcha. And Amy, just so you know, um, there are certain varieties of blackberry, they call them the thornless variety. Uh, you can find them at big box stores now. So they're getting pretty nifty uh, with creating a uh, garden type uh, edible blackberry species or varietals, I should say. Um, and my last question, uh, Morgan, is wild coffee edible? Can you share a little bit more about that? I know it was, um, you know, one of your closing statements, but if you can yeah. expand it, I'm very keen on that. I can. Um, this was actually one that I had to do a little bit more research on because it's not one that is commercially produced. Now I'm interested in growing it because I want to try it. Um, it is supposedly like a bland version of coffee, but for some oh, people it? it gives you that same flavor um, and it's, it doesn't have caffeine. Um, though I, I don't think a lot of people are producing it for that purpose. It's just kind of a nice pretty plant. But it was one where I was like, caffeineless coffee? That sounds amazing. Right. <laughs> well, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, if uh, Folks, if you don't have any other questions, uh, I'm going to thank Morgan uh, again for her valuable time. Morgan, thank you so much again from the bottom of my heart. What a wonderful presentation. You blew us away. Um, you intrigued us, you inspired us, you gave us all the keys in case we want to grow these natives in our home setting. So thank you so much again. We hope to see you at the Holiday Social next month. And uh, with that, uh, I bid you guys adieu. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me again. All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.